Hello, this is Robert Stark. I am uh, joined here with uh, Dota from uh, Occident Invicta. Dota, it's uh, great having you back on. Thank you very much for inviting me back. So we're going to be discussing uh, your articles you've written uh, on the topics of uh, oligarchy and on uh, national capitalism. Uh, the first one I'd like to discuss is the one oligarchy uh, one uh, one hundred one. Oligarchy one hundred one. Uh, this is about this uh, BBC report that uh, five banks, J.P. Morgan, uh, Citigroup, and a number of other ones have uh, rigged the foreign exchange market. Right. Well, basically, what they were doing is, from what I recall. Um, members from these banks basically met up in a chat room and uh, decided on uh, decided to rig the market by entering in a position earlier on during the day, during the session, and then exiting that position just before the session would end. And they would obviously buy up a huge, you know, they buy up a huge volume of currency, thereby, you know, making the market go in their direction. And then they pretty much dump it at the end of the session. That's my understanding of what they were up to. And uh, it seemed to have worked. They were, they fooled uh, a lot of people, and they've been doing this since, I believe, the late 2000s, like 2008 and on. It's remarkable they never got caught. Well, they, got a, they got a fine, but you're, the point you're making that it's basically like a slap on, a, on, the, on the wrist. Oh, yes. Um, because, of course, these people, um, well, of course, they're banks. I mean, to them, a fine you know, fine like that is a mere slap on the wrist. It really is. Um, and of course, it's not just, um, it's it's basically regular ordinary traders that lose, you know. And um, I mean, this reminds me of another a similar, a similar scandal, I think in the 1970s, where um, a couple of these, a couple of um, individuals, a couple of businessmen, billionaires in the US tried to uh, rig the uh, the silver market. I cannot remember the fellow's name, but uh, this is something he tried to do in the 70s by just buying up a lot of silver and driving artificially driving the price up. And then obviously others get into it as well. And then they, as the price is artificially inflated, they simply dump the goods at that artificially inflated price, making in a, raking in huge profits. I guess this was, I guess that was the idea here as well. So what these guys are doing is we're getting together and they're cooperating, you know, and that's ironic because these banks are supposed to be competitors, you know, and, um, but that was not the case. So basically oligarchy in action. They got together, decided where the market was going to go, decided sort of shoring up the price of the currency. And then before the session would end, they'd dump it. Now, a lot of day traders, ordinary day traders would be ruined in this way, you know. So um, it's, uh, it was pretty shameful in my view. And it makes a mockery of capitalism in general. Yeah, it is a monopoly because if they're not competing with each other, then they the same bank. Well, yeah, I mean, they're more of an oligarchy, actually. You know, you have a bunch of people, you have a bunch of these huge organizations, companies or whatever, and what they're really doing is that they're uh, they're cooperating with one another. I mean, I mean, on the surface, it seems like they're competing with one another, but in reality, they're actually cooperating with one another. With one another. And really, this shouldn't come as a surprise, you know, and what I found particularly appalling was that these are banks in the U.S. and in the U.K. So it's not that so it's, so it's not that they're just a bunch of American banks that are sort of getting together here and you know plotting. But it's uh, there's a sort of there's a certain international component to this. You had British banks as well in it as well. So uh, it was uh, it was really quite the scandal. I mean, it, you know, this story kind of um, hit close to home because I was demo trading forex you know, in 2008 and 2009, I never really did put any actual money to the Forex market, but I did demo trade the market from time to time using various platforms like IBFX and such. Well, I don't think the company is even in, is even in operation anymore. But so to me, you know, this was, uh, you know, it's kind of the story kind of hit close to home because I was quite interested in the Forex market. Still am to some extent. I do check on the market from time to time, you know, and I have known people that have lost a lot of money in Forex, you know, friends of the family and such. So it's really quite shameful because what they're really doing is they're ruining a lot of traders who do this, some of them who do this for a living, and then some of them who simply, you know, use this as a financial instrument, you know, just uh, 
something to build up their savings. That's just a that's just another um, instrument in their portfolio. You know, regular people getting screwed this way. So it was. It really is a very shameful incident here. So the point you make is that it's not not a free market. Uh, do you get? I guess a lot of a lot of people who are apologists for this will uh, defend. They'll defend and say it's just part of the free market, and uh, we should. There should be no regulations on uh, fin- financial transactions. Well, yes. Uh, see, that's the, that's sort of the problem here. You know, um, we're we're looking at this. What capitalism has really become now is basically. Uh, a capitalism essentially becomes leads to oligarchies because there's some there's some individuals in the economy that obviously have access to you know more resources than others, and it's you know if there's no government regulation at some point they will form these oligarchies and they will cooperate rather than compete, and it's just a very natural thing you know I mean uh, it just it just makes sense and then of course they'll you know they'll do so with the cooperation of the state it's all like mercantilism in the 17th century where you had these merchants you know merchant class getting into business with um, you know, the state. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very similar idea here. You have certain powerful corporate elites, you know, they're in bed with the state, essentially, that gives them cover to continue doing what they're doing. Um, this is not really the capitalism that Adam Smith had in mind, though. Smith's idea of capitalism was very different, and that's also because Smith was living in a time that was before, you know, the, uh, the era of uh, mass production and mass consumption. So he envisioned you know, to him, a bunch of small businesses competing against each other. He, he, yeah, he basically believed that um, if you have, I mean, you have an, an area, you know, like a neighborhood or a town or something, and then you had local businesses taking care of their communities. And that's all it was, as far as he was concerned. Because you're looking at, you're looking at a time when feudalism was obviously on the decline. And so, you know, resources were now in the hands of the private sector. Or what would eventually become the private sector in, in in the hands of private individuals, you know, to do as they pleased. Which is why I've often said that Smith's um, Adam Smith's capitalism was basically just an economic extension of you know Loki and liberalism. It was that was basically the same idea. It was just an, it was just an economic extension of John Locke. You know, you have you know people have the right, you know, to determine their own livelihood, and you know that gives them a self you know a certain measure of self uh, you know self sufficiency and determination. That sort of that's that's the idea. Now Smith obviously did not really see an era where you know certain corporations would then make a grab for you know major resources in the economy. You know that never really occurred to him because obviously he had not seen mass production, which would also in time make you know the average worker indispensable. I mean, sorry, dispensable. <laughs> Quite the opposite. So you see it. So uh, it's basically what capitalism has led to. Uh, do you see this as the inevitable result of capitalism? Um, see, it's hard to say. Like I said, what we're looking at right now is mass production, the, you know, the era of mass production, you know. And um, capitalism with mass production is, in my view, a, a pretty a pretty toxic combination, you know. And uh, – of course, now, Smith obviously did not really realize and he could not foresee the various technological innovations that would come in manufacturing, right? And so this was something that he did not know, I would assume. And so with mass production, you know, you've, you've got – mass production is what's shaped capitalism. And the way people – it's just shaped what we see as, you know, what we know as the common perception of capitalism, you know. And uh, this has led to many various other issues because as production became more efficient, um, the only way capitalism could keep going to, to sustain itself would be to continue to, you know, increase output. And of course, if output is increased, then there has to be, you know, a market to consume that output. So the domestic market is not big enough. Then the only option is to export. And that's where colonialism then basically came about, because the idea behind colonialism is to basically capture foreign markets mostly. You know, not really rule over them in the same way as, you know, the Romans or the Ottomans ruled over their territories. Not really. The idea, what made European colonialism so different from some of the older brands of colonialism, like, say, you know, Islamic colonialism or whatever, is that in this case, you know, the the colonies were treated as markets and they were kept at arm's length. You know, these are not like the Romans or the Abbasids or some of these other empires throughout history, 
that were trying to, you know, create this major, you know, unit, like, a, like, a, like, you know, like a major empire of sorts. I mean, it was an empire in a manner of speaking, but the idea was to capture markets because without those ma- markets, you know, their economies would implode. There'd be a lot of production, but there would be no consumption. So at some point, production would have to be scaled back, which would, you know, result in people losing their jobs and then the economy basically just imploding. So that's what's become of capitalism. It's much of it has to do with basically mass production and of course mass consumption as well. So uh Bay Area guy has this that article and he points out that uh uh Glenn Greenwald wrote an article about how the elites embrace uh, a lot of these uh, uh so called social justice causes as a means of well, his argument is that it's a mean of promoting their own power and sanitizing their crimes. Did you write on that? Or did you write about that Glenn Greenwald article? I read his article. Yes, um, it's 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 worthwhile point. I think what the Ray guy was actually saying, and uh, he's actually quite right when he points out that traditionally the left was more focused on economic justice and economic equality, but somehow because of recent trends, and of course by recent I mean mostly post-World War trends, the left essentially became um, somewhat saturated with Marxism, with Marxism, cultural Marxism. So in this case, of course, the, the, the focus shifted away from economic justice to social justice. But of course, I don't really see this as social justice. This is in some ways a parody of social justice. So yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting way of actually accomplishing a very interesting goal, and that is to obviously... Uh, divert attention away from economic issues and create a society that is in some ways at war with one another. I mean, I don't necessarily, subs- I don't really subscribe to Marxism and to, you know, the Marxist theory of class struggle. I think it's a very, um, it's a very two dimensional way of looking at history. There's a lot more to history and, and there's, you know, there's a lot more to history than simply looking at, looking at it through the lens of class struggle. So, but in this, in this case, but if I would actually sort of you know, parody Marxism, I would say that what they've really done is that they've, you know, with their emphasis on social justice and, you know, the free show of the cultural left, as Robert Lindsay likes to say, call it, um, what they've really done is they've sort of restructured a vertical class war into a horizontal class war. And I think that was what, and I think that was the gist of what Barrier Guy was getting at, because what he was trying to point out is that there is no real focus on economics anymore. And that, and see, economic, see, economic justice is, in my view, more um, leads to egalitarianism and leads to, you know, long-term social stability. Because without, you know, because without economic stability, if you stability, look at the left now, originally it was about class. They talk about stuff like race, gender, sexual orientation. The, the except for I guess Bernie Sanders is talking a lot about. The class issues, but he's someone who's not, he's not part of the establishment. He's someone who's sort of part of the, like the sixties era left. Uh, what is your take? Right. What is your sort of take on Bernie Sanders? To be honest, um, I haven't, I don't really don't know a whole lot about him, but I do understand where he's coming from because as I pointed out, the, the old left was more concerned with, uh, was more concerned with economic justice. And in some ways, that makes more sense. See, in my view, that is actual, that is, that is egalitarianism in the truest sense. Because when you create economic prosperity, you're creating it for everybody, regardless of who they are, where they come from, or what their sexual orientation is, and so on and so forth. There's no identity politics. You know, when the economy is strong, when per capita incomes are increasing, it benefits all citizens. And that's basically the idea. But that is essentially not really what our elites want. So their focus what now. The modern, course, what the modern left does is uh, they will support the agenda of the corporations and the plutocracy in exchange for more affirmative action for uh, women and minorities. That's basically what they're all about. I would say so. Yes, uh, this sort of thing definitely benefits them. You know, um, especially with say the rise of feminism in the '60s and onwards. You know, it's created a, you know, a market not only a market, but it has essentially broadened the tax base. Women have entered the workforce, so wages have plummeted. So a lot of these social justice causes invariably end up serving, you know, the interests of the elites, you know, and there's also something to be said for a lot of this, a lot of the so-called philanthropy that's, uh, you know, that these elites are engaged in, you know, like Bill Gates and, you know, Warren Buffett and such. And, uh, you know, what they're, what they're into is, you know, when they, when they donate to these charitable causes, what they're really doing is donating to causes such as feminism and such. I mean, 
I, I believe Warren was into um, had uh, supported um, an initiative, an abortion on demand uh, fund drive, or something to that something to that effect, uh, a while ago. It's also and, a great um, way for them to get a tax write off. Oh yeah, undoubtedly. So they pursue their own agenda and they get a tax write off as well because they can simply they can simply show this as you know show these activities as charitable endeavors. Uh, yeah, and of course Bill Gates has been Bill Gates and you know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been quite active in supporting you know leftist causes. And um, I mean, uh, recently I'd read well not recently as in I think last year I read about some initiatives in Africa, you know basically helping African farmers of uh, women farmers specifically. You know we're not looking at farmers but specifically women farmers. So the money goes specifically there, and so they do have their own. I know uh, Whole Foods. I think Whole Foods was involved in something like that. Uh, with the d- donation, is that the one you're talking about? Interesting. Hmm. Um. Not aware of it, but I wouldn't be surprised. But yes, a lot of these oh, that, charitable. Oh, that foundations. was not Africa. Whole Foods was doing something for. Oh, it was for helping women start up businesses in uh, uh, your home country, India. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and this is how they basically export feminism to the third world. Because by specifically channeling resources to women, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to hammer home here, the point they're trying to hammer, especially in third world countries, is, a, is that women are also a class in the Marxist sense of the word, as a class in opposition to men whose interests are in opposition to men. Because in the third world, and well, I shouldn't really, really say in the third world, but in basically in the non-Western world, whether it's developed or not, or otherwise, you know, women have a different attitude, right? I mean, they believe that when they look at men, they see their, you know, their uncles, their brothers, their fathers, and so on. But in, in the West, it's it's different. It's, uh, women see men as, you know, at best, you know, competitors or at worst predators. You know, they're a, they're a class in a Marxist sense of the word, you know, a class in opposition to women. That's how men are seen in, in, in the West. And so by by pursuing these activities in the third world, they're trying to drive home the same point that, you know, women in the third world are also, you know, a class, a distinct class and a class in opposition to men with interests that run contrary to the interests of men. And uh, it's, yeah, I mean, this is something we've been doing for a while, though. I mean, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, even even the Rockefellers, for example, they've been also into, uh, have also been pursuing these activities. I mean, I've been, when I was going through um, various homepages on uh, various, um, the home pages of various women's studies departments throughout certain you know US universities such as the uh the University of Rochester and uh the University of Hawaii and if you go i mean uh, to name just a couple i mean off the top of my head and they op- they quite openly discuss taking uh you know their women's studies departments quite openly uh, talk about getting grants from the Ford and the Rockefeller Foundation so this is not these aren't really new trends here you know i mean if it wasn't for their support. I don't even think feminism would have made it into the 80s. And yeah, that's the point that uh, that barrier guy makes, that it's more important to uh, focus on the elites themselves, uh, focusing too much on like the social justice warriors. Uh, those people, basically, they're pawns, and they're not, they're not really worth all the energy uh, discussing them. It's more important to focus on the plutocracy. I, I definitely agree with him. You know, I mean, the social justice warriors are basically the grunts. Uh, they are the shock troops of the cultural Marxist left and our elites mostly. You know, they do the, they do their dirty work on the ground. You know, their job is to, you know, spy on behalf of the elite. You know, spy on behalf of Big Brother. You know, determine who the you know, who the, dis- the the dissidents are and you know determine people who are the so-called Winston Smiths of our society and then sort of root them out and then destroy them, usually by attacking their livelihoods and their sources of income. So I don't really think it's important to actually focus specifically on those guys, but uh, I do think it'd be, it's, it's more important to actually understand what our elites are doing and what they're up to and uh, get a better understanding of their initiatives. Because currently the system that's in place is one that cannot function without our cooperation. You know, universities, Hollywood, a lot of the degeneracy that's been pumped out that our elites have been manufacturing and then force feeding us over the last few decades. You know, this cannot happen without a certain degree of cooperation from society, at least at this point. So so that's I think Barry Guy is quite right when he uh, when he points this out, you know, that we should be focusing on on our elites. And I did make that point in my in my article as well, where uh, when I spoke of resisting the elites, you know, stay away from university, stay out of debt. You know, um, so uh, yeah, I want to get into that article later in the show. 
But I want to for I want to look at this one, uh, National Capitalism: A Third Alternative. And this one was posted on your blog and over at Alternative Right. And uh, do you know? Are you? I'm not sure. Are you familiar with uh, Alain de Benoit? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Are you familiar, familiar with the with writer uh, Alain de Benoit? No, I don't. No, I, I I'm I'm not familiar with him. No. Okay, but he's critic. He's actually critical of the concept of national capitalism because the point he makes is that uh, uh, capitalists are not content with just making profits within a country, that uh, capitalism inevitably leads to globalization because capitalists want to uh, go beyond the national borders to, uh, to increase their profits and through things like uh, mass immigration and free trade. Uh, you make the case for national capitalism do you believe that uh, national capitalism is viable, or do you think that uh, globalization is an inevitable result of capitalism? At this point, I would have to agree that you know you cannot turn back the clock, and globalization is really here to stay. And capitalism has its flaws, and I'm the first to admit that it does have its flaws. And uh, in some ways, it is not a very sustainable system. But I do agree. But I do. But I will say that if capitalism is a system that if capitalism is here to stay, then what capitalists should really do is focus their efforts at, you know, focus their efforts at furthering the interests, the economic interests of their own countries. You know, that's that's basically what that's basically what national capitalism should do. Now, I understand what he's saying, and I can see this is this is the this is the case in the West, which is very unfortunate. You know, I mean, one of the reasons why mass immigration is is such a big deal in the West is obviously because. Western economies are at this point largely services based economies, what you call tertiary sectors. And because they're services dominated economies, and since services cannot really be exported, well, I suppose some services can be exported, but for the most part, it's goods and services, it's goods that are mostly products, tangible products that are really exported, and they make up the bulk of international trade even today. So if services cannot be exported, and if Western economies are largely service services oriented, then the only way to keep their economy, to keep these economies afloat is to simply keep importing immigrants who would eventually become consumers of these services. So it's, it's funny because in the old days, of course, when manufacturing was big in the 1800s and the early 19th century, uh, in the 1900s, you know, the colonialism was, was important, you know, strategically, uh, it was a strategically important uh, activity because you had to go out there and capture markets and then, you know, force them to buy your stuff. I mean, the U.S. has been doing this for decades, you know. I mean, they've, uh, they've also sold a lot of agricultural output to Iraq, for example, when Saddam Hussein sabotaged Iraq's own agricultural industry, which is very similar to what Britain did to India with regards to textiles in the 1800s, 1850s, and onwards. Now, in the, now but today, what we're doing, rather than going out and colonizing a country, what, what we're doing with mass immigration is actually quite, quite literally importing consumers into our borders, now this is now this doesn't necessarily always have to be the case because if you look at Japan, you know the Japanese and even the Koreans to some degree are actually quite patriotic. Even their businesses, you know, it's all about mindset really. I mean, it depends on it depends on it depends on your values. I mean, to the Japanese, there's a saying, you know, to be a good patriot, you need to be a good son. And uh, so, yeah, so Japan has a very uh, strict immigration policy, and it's if you look at the country. Uh, it's extremely homogenous. I think it's like 99% Japanese and 1% uh, Korean. Would they, so you would, so you're giving Japan as an example. True. They are, yeah, they are homogenous, but also they, they prefer to keep it that way. I mean, polls have shown that immigration is highly unpopular, you know, amongst the Japanese. So they prefer to keep it that way. And they also, they prefer to keep certain policies, you know, in place because of overwhelming public support. Now, does with regards to Japan have a does Japan have a, Sorry, a no. strong social safety net? Uh, they do have some. They do have some social safety, but I'm not entirely aware of how their social safety net works. I do know that they do, they, they've got something. I know there's virtually none in China, despite being a communist country. But as to Japan and their capitalist model, basically, it, it, there's no real model here. It's basically just Japanese businessmen who have a certain outlook. They have a certain mindset that. If we're going to go into business, we should be benefiting Japan. You know, we should be 
cooperating with one another and competing with the rest of the world. And that's what national capitalism does. National capitalism will eventually then enable a country to compete effectively with other countries. And in the case of Japan, of course, it's important because to them, you know, if you, can, you, you, know, if you cannot be a good patriot without being a good son. So a lot of businesses feel that they owe their loyalty to Japan first, first and foremost. And uh, so they, a lot of companies, I think like Toyota, for example, I remember reading somewhere, would, you know, they would source a lot of their parts locally. It would be more expensive, but that's what they would do. Um, whereas in the West, this is really not the case anymore. But again, Japan also has a very strong, I mean, Japanese culture, Japanese, the Japanese people have a very strong racial identity. See, in the West, that no longer exists. So all that's left, of course, is the pursuit of profit. And that is it. That is all. I mean, I remember, um, I, I remember um, writing about this on the blog where I was uh, working for a local company and... Uh, I was one of one of my one of my assignments was to um you know have these promotion items made and I started looking for local suppliers and I then I submitted it to my boss and I said that you know these are some of the local suppliers and by local I mean national actually in Canada basically Canada wide so I found some suppliers in Vancouver and I said that they've got the best they've got the most competitive prices you know per piece and she said not good enough start looking start looking at China so then I logged on to the, you know, the Alibaba e-commerce portal and uh, I started looking through there, started looking at options in China. But you see, it never even occurred to me initially to start looking at China. I mean, to me, my, my idea was that, you know, we should try to keep our money here in Canada. But that's really, that's really, that it doesn't, that, that, that's not a priority that's shared by a lot of businesses here. To them, it's all about. A lot you know, of it is the point you're making is that it's not just the economic system; it's a, uh, it's a culture as well. Uh, people grow up in Japan with a sense of uh, nationalism, and in this country, uh, most of the elite has a total, uh, totally internationalistic outlook. They're, they're they just care about about profits, obviously. Uh, corporate CEOs in Japan are, I mean, they're capitalists, they're driven by profits, but there's still a culture there where you're, you're expected to put your country first. Exactly. National and, capitalism is merely an attitude because capitalism itself is not, capitalism is not like Marxism, which comes with this worldview in place. You know, I mean, there are certain underlying Western values upon which capitalism stands, but such as individualism. But for the most part, capitalism is merely an economic system. You know, it's just, it's neutral. It's it's an economic system. You know, it's it, it's basically a system where the factors of production, land, labor, capital, are in the hands of the private sector. That's all it is. But nothing more, nothing less. That's all it is. Now, how you use the system depends on your culture. If you're like the Japanese or the Koreans and you believe that, you know, if these resources are in the hands of the private sector and if the private sector is comprised of patriotic individuals, then businesses by default will you know, make it a priority to serve their own nations, you know, and uh, first and f they would they would try their hardest to serve their own countries, their own home countries, you know. So they compete internationally, but the idea was to serve their own countries. That's just an outlook. Now, this has nothing to do with capitalism. This has more to do with culture. In the West, of course, as, you know, we were just discussing, this, since there's no real racial identity, much of that racial identity has been diluted through multiculturalism, this becomes much harder. Do you think the uh, Japanese businessmen, do you think they act, are patriotic or do you think it is more to do is the regulations put in by the government? And do you think if given the opportunity, they would behave in the manner of the American elites if they, if they were allowed to? Well, I'm thinking if they wanted to, they probably would have done these things. They probably would have found ways to lobby and pressure their governments, but they haven't, you know. In the West, this is a very common occurrence. You have these, um, you've got elites that work with one another, and then they, they sort of lobby the government to provide them with, you know, legal and sometimes even military cover to continue doing what they're doing. But if the Japanese could have done this, they probably would have. But I don't think they really do. I don't think they really want to. Their idea is to basically serve their own countries. There's a certain degree of patriotism in Japan that's very hard to comprehend in the West. There, uh, there really is. It's a strong, it's a very strong sense that, you know, Japan is, you know, a great nation, and of course, everyone needs to do their bit. You can't have so a great with nation the, without having. With the Western elites we have, uh, do you think it's necessary to uh, push for more, uh, like wealth confiscation and raising taxes on the rich as a way 
to deal with the problem. I do think that they, there should be some regulations in place. You know, I mean, I hate to sound like Ralph Nader here, but you know, he was essentially correct when he <laughs> pointed out that a lot of these corporations just don't don't give a crap at all. And so, you know, there has to come a time where you know governments have to step up on behalf of their people. You know, the people who elected them into power to begin with, and then sort of you know, mandate certain regulations. You know, to keep the capital within their countries, because right now, I mean, you can just if you don't like the tax, if you don't like paying taxes, you can just move the headquarters to somewhere else. And I think Halle Burton moved their headquarters too. I think they moved them to the Middle East. I think to Dubai, as a matter of fact. But this is something that you can do. Whereas, you know, in, in Japan... And a, lot Korea, of them, a lot of corporations like the island, I think it's the Cayman Islands, has this one building where all these corporations have their headquarters in this one small building in the Cayman Islands. Oh, yeah. And see, this is this is shameful, though. I mean, also just look, take a look at how, just take a look at the ratio between um, workers and um, CEO and CEOs. Um, that is in terms of wages and uh, you know income, national incomes. Uh, sorry, that is uh, annual incomes. So, in the U.S., CEOs make over, I think, 400 times more than the average worker. Whereas in Japan, yeah, I have the, the, I ratio, have the statistics up on it's on the alternative right article I'll link to it in the United States it's 475 uh Mexico oh, yeah. it's 47 uh J- Japan's the, has the de- uh, the lowest ratio to pay worker it's 11 now see now it's 11 course. to 1 now, and then Germany is 12 to 1 so my question is uh, how much regulation do they have to keep the pay in check like what is the tax rate on the top income bracket in some countries i don't think it's really all about, i don't think it's all about i don't think it's really about taxes either though and that's uh, one of the points i wanted to come to i mean if you look at canada for example canadian elites would end up doing the same thing if they had the chance to and you know in canada the tax rates are fairly high you know if you are um, if you're uh, you know the wealthy end up paying about 45 percent in taxes which is huge but of course there's ways around it though uh what's ideal and I suppose this is more of a not what is, but a what ought to be scenario is where people is where elites should have a sense of patriotism to begin with so that you don't really need these regulations. I know I sound kind of confusion here. You know, it's kind of how confusionism is. You know, there shouldn't really be these laws in place. People should simply do simply people should simply do these things. You know, in the case maybe, of Japan, that's, I mean, maybe that's too idealistic. Maybe there needs to be that's kind of assuming the best of human nature. Oh, yeah, I suppose it is. It is a little idealistic. I, I don't deny. But see, in Japan, of course, 11 to 1 is probably the, the smallest ratio, you know. And I'm fairly certain that, you know, patriotism definitely has a lot to do with this. You know, it's, so it's, it's it's fascinating stuff. I mean, Japan's business culture is is quite interesting. It's also really quite high trust, which is somewhat unusual in Asia. But they're really quite high trust. They've got their whole Karitsu network thing going. It's, so uh, with the way the Karitsu... The banks, the corporations actually have their own bank instead of having to borrow money from another bank. That's what it is. They pull their resources together and they run the, they run their own bank called the Koretsu. Yes, they do. And uh, it's not just through banking, but even there, even, there are times where suppliers and and vendors, suppliers and their customers, you know, retailers and such would sort of, buy each other's shares. So the idea is that, you know, we all succeed or we all fail. We all rise together, we all fall together. And this is something, and again, like I said, you know, forming these kinds of networks requires a very strong degree of racial awareness and racial consciousness, something which is almost impossible or even unthinkable in the West. But, you know, the Japanese have been able to pull it off. And it's it's a pretty interesting way of doing business, I think. And I'll give you an example in places where the elites are, uh, Places that are very uh, diverse. A uh, place like uh, the Japanese elite, they live in Tokyo, so that's very homogenous. And they grew up with a different mindset. I think elites who grow up in uh, diverse cities like L.A., New York, and London grow up with a very parasitic mindset. I, I would, I would, yeah. I mean, uh, it goes without saying that multiculturalism definitely has, uh, you know, a diluting effect on uh, national identity. they grow identity. up, it's a low, it's a low trust environment where everyone. They don't see people as part of their community. They see them as people to like uh, to screw over. They grow up with that mindset. In some ways, yes. You no, know, and um, 
this multiculturalism, apart from having uh, you know economic some serious economic repercussions, mostly negative, it also has a more uh, damaging effect on democracy as well. So uh, I really the you know this is something Beria has spoken about as well. You know what what's the cost of these programs? So there's an upkeep here, you know, and the, that upkeep is now being paid for by you know the white taxpayer. But for how long? With multiculturalism and feminism and so on. I mean, a lot of these leftist uh, programs have have an upkeep. So well, you make the point has... that the uh, United Arab Emirates has one of the most uh, generous welfare systems in the world, but it's only available to their own citizens. So you were when you lived there, you were not able to partake in it. Oh no, absolutely not. And there's no way I would become a citizen, or anyone could become a citizen living in the UAE. You just you just cannot. So, to them, you know, they, see, the UAE is not really a multicultural society. You know, it's a diverse society, but it's not a multicultural society. Multiculturalism is 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 a, is a means to managing diversity. And the other way is assimilation, or then you have the UAE, where the, the you know the, the 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 Dubai way, the Dubai method, which is basically creating this segregated class structure. So, but of course, that's not going to fly in the West. So in the West, typically it was assimilation or multiculturalism. And now, of course, our elites this, have pretty much thrown their resources behind multiculturalism. Did you, living in Dubai, did you find that article by Matt Forney to be accurate? Were you were you shocked by it or not really? No, not really. I've heard stories of uh, their depravity. And uh, they're, uh, I mean, the sheikhs are truly a very degenerate class. I mean, as uh, as that writer A. Gill pointed out, you know, in his article in the Vanity Fair, which was, which was actually banned in the buy, pretty funny article, actually. I enjoyed it. Uh, quite accurate, though, but a lot of these Emiratis are born retired, and, you know, Emirati sheikhs are, they're just, they're born into luxury, and they don't really have to do anything. You know, I mean, in, in the West, I mean, elites are still, you know, elites still bring up their young to, to be, you know, traditionally, anyhow, to become more cultured and so on contribute to society and the traditional the traditional idea is that elites are supposed to enrich society you know, they've got more leisure time so they should spend that time pursuing you know higher culture such as art philosophy and then sort of contribute to you know the culture in which they were born into this is not really the case in the middle east as a matter of fact it's not really even the case in south asia but uh, in the middle east you know these people have so much money they have so much leisure time and it's basically decadence they pursue so shows you the difference and not another difference you know between east and west uh what was your uh personal uh what was your personal lifestyle like in that in uh, when you lived in dubai what was your uh, social status uh middle class mostly we lived in an area which was which was a very um sort of like a very indian area an Indian zone of the city. I mean, this Dubai is a very segregated city, right? So, yeah, so you didn't I mean, really, seen, you didn't personally associate with the oil shakes. Oh, absolutely not. There's no way. No, absolutely not. I mean, I do know. I had a, I had a cousin. I have. I mean, I think he's still in the business. He's, uh, he's a millionaire many times over, and I know he has contacts among the shakes. But I have personally never, never, never had the opportunity to associate with any of them. So. Um, no, not not me. Dubai is a very segregated society, anyhow. I mean, I'd seen I'd seen the segregation throughout the '90s, but now it's uh, it's uh, not as ghettoized as it used to be during the '90s, where you had certain areas, certain ethnic enclaves, you know, around the city. Like Dara was specifically for South Asians, Jumeirah was for Europeans, specifically the British, and so on and so forth. So, with uh, you talk about a welfare state, so. Uh, the point you made about uh, United Arab Emirates, they have a, it's a citizen's dividend for their own citizens. Uh, work in I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat that again, Robert? You, may, you, you say that a welfare state can only work in a homogenous society. Preferable, actually. It's preferable to work. It's, it, it, I mean, it works in a homogenous society. I mean, it, it the best results are in a homogenous society, largely. I mean, in, uh, in in multicultural societies, or you know, in societies in the West where identity politics is the order of the day, 
you know, you use welfare to keep certain groups, you know, as you know, as as a de- as dependents on on the state. This is particularly the case in Europe, and even here um, in in North America. I mean, if you're waging war against the white majority, and you have say a lot of Mexicans or whatever who are coming in, you know, they'll vote Democrats simply because the Democrats are probably more likely to give them handouts compared to some of the other parties, mostly the, most likely the Republicans. But of course, the Republicans want them as well for cheap labor. But, you know, in, in, in a more homogenous society, socialism tends, well, at least some social programs, targeted social programs tend to work because there's, a high, there's high trust in these, in these, you know, in, in these cultures. And so, uh, in, you know, in such, in such a situation, I think the welfare state does a far better job, you know, doing what it's supposed to do you know, in terms of egalitarian, in terms of its egalitarian goals, as opposed to in a multicultural society. What is the art? So you wrote another article about, uh, let me find this. Oh, yes. You wrote this article called America's Tainted Democracy. And uh, right. this is about a South Asian uh, businessman in the United States. So there was this BBC documentary and uh oh it's just a news clipping from the BBC website actually okay so there's this uh Pakistani businessman who was uh he was lobbying the US government to give more foreign aid to uh Pakistan right and then of course you've got a very you've got a very strong Indian lobby as well in place right now that's sort of emulating the tactics of the Jewish lobby and uh i think the idea that I was trying to convey here, this article is that multiculturalism is quite detrimental to the health of democracy. You know, I mean, diversity will also do that to you, for the most part. I would say that if you want to see what American democracy looks like in 30 years or 40 years, take a look at India's democracy today. You know, I mean, in India, for example, you've got, I mean, it's a democracy, a manner of speaking, but it's one where there is no competition of ideologies. You know, I mean, in the U.S., because you know Western culture tends to be more universal, you have a competition of ideologies, where an, where, where an ideology is in some ways a universal interpretation of reality. But in India, people will simply vote for whoever is a part of their own caste or their own religion. So as my favorite journalist, Indian journalist Akar Patel points out, there are no debates in Indian politics because there's no need for it. If you're simply going to vote for your own man, for somebody from your own caste, or someone from your, you know someone along ethnic lines or linguistic lines, and there's no need for debate. You debate, debate. You know the whole idea behind debating is that you debate universal principles, principles that can apply universally. So, I do think that in time, this is what's going to happen. You have a bunch of you know when, as America becomes more and more diverse, um, it, it you know the health of American democracy begins to somewhat deteriorate, because democracy does not really check tribalism. As a matter of fact, democracy enables tribalism, you know, and we see this very clearly in in South Asia and even in in the Middle East. I mean, in the Middle East, I remember you had these, um, you know, you've got these strong, you had these strongman dictatorship rules, right? Rulers like, you know, Mubarak in Egypt or, you know, you had Saddam Hussein, obviously. And, I've spoken to a lot of Christians you know, over the years, and a lot of them said that, you know, even though these people were dictators, they still felt safe living, you know, within these dictatorships because their interests were protected by these dictators. Iraqi Christians especially were fond of Saddam because he actually kept them safe. Now, if Iraq were a majority, things, I mean, if, I'm sorry, if Iraq were a democracy, then, you know, a lot of these, there would be, there would be a lot of anti-Christian sentiment that would become you know, politically viable. So in some ways, I do think that democracy actually enables tribalism, you know, and in, in certain societies, you know, like in like in, in the non-Western world, you know, there's a very fine line that separates democracy from mob rule. So in India as well, for example, one of the reasons why Modi was able to win is because he was basically, he basically ruled the anti-Muslim consensus. And while people talk about how he's a great economist and so on and so forth, there's no real evidence that he is a great economist. Gujarat was prosperous before he came to power, and it's going to be prosperous long after he retires. You know, so it's 
this, and I think this is what's going to happen in the U.S. as well. You know, as the U.S. becomes more diverse, you'll have a bunch of ethnic groups competing and, uh, you know, fighting amongst themselves to consolidate their own power and their own, you know, share of the economy. And this is the opposite. Do you think this, this whole this sort all... of, uh, right now there's this concept of kind of this rainbow coalition. Do you think that will break up and it'll just be like every tribe for itself? Well, that depends. I think Barrier Guy has the right idea here. He mentions that if the U.S. becomes economically impoverished imp- and, uh, you know, as the U.S. economy continues to deteriorate, what will happen is there won't be a lot of funding for a lot of these liberal programs, and that's when the Rainbow Coalition will break apart. And I think he's right there. You know, there's an upkeep here, right? There's an, there's an upkeep here, you know, that keeps these people together for now. But once resources begin to dry up, you know, what then? You know, feminism has tremendous upkeep. And so I, I do think that, of course, if, as the U.S. becomes poorer economically, uh, the liberal coalition, this rainbow coalition might fall apart. But at this point in time, they're, they're a useful political tool. Uh, what role do you see do you see, see uh, South Asians playing in the future of the United States? Um, I honestly do believe that they're poised to become the next uh, the next generation of elites in the U.S. because they're highly selected, they're highly intelligent, and uh, they're quite affluent. And they seem to be, uh, they seem to, they're able to somewhat outcompete some of the other ethnic groups in the U.S. And not by a narrow margin, but by, by a huge margin. I believe that the second uh, most affluent group, at least Indians are, Indians are the second most affluent group in the U.S. I think second, just just after the Jews. So Do you think they could surpass easily, them at some point? I highly doubt that, but they will they will have a seat at the table and that's what they want. I mean, if you, if you, if you'd seen that video, which I, you know, which I posted on the website, that's exactly what, um, that rep, that representative of the, um, one of the Indian lobbies had said very quite explicitly, we want a seat at the table. They're not able to dominate obviously, and they never will be for various reasons, for some very obvious reasons. But I think what they want is they want a seat at the table. And I think in this new multicultural democracy, that's what's going to happen. Every ethnicity will want a seat at the table and there'll be a considerable bit of competition. Now, some, I think, will be worse off than others. For example, African-Americans will be much worse off in this new America because these new Asian elites, whether they're Koreans or Indians, um, they're not really going to care much about the interests of African-Americans. They don't really suffer from any form of guilt. And Mexicans will obviously be worse off as well. So you think so, that um, do you think do you think that guy in South Carolina was idiotic when he said uh, uh, Black Americans are taking over the country? Who's taking over the country? I'm sorry. The do you think the sh- the South Carolina shooter was idiotic when he said Black Americans are taking over the country? Oh yeah, I think so. <laughs> I definitely think so. There's no way they can do. They can, there's no way they can do that. You know, they uh, they they're quite disadvantaged economically and there's they they pose no real threat you know they can be used as a tool of course by democrats and mostly our elites but i don't think they pose a a major threat in any in any way i do think that um as a point out i do think that east asians and south asians are poised to you know have a much better chance of getting their seat at the table so to speak south asians more so american would you say would you say south asians more so than east asians at this point, I would say so, yes. I do think East Asians have a very strong chance, too, actually. They're, uh, they've got very similar values. And uh, But, of course, the, let's not forget, though. Sorry, what, what would you think? say is the biggest... What are the biggest differences between South Asians and East Asians? Well, in terms of their worldviews, they're obviously very different, right? I mean, South Asian, the South Asian worldview, regardless of religion, is largely Hindu, whereas... The East Asian worldview is mostly confusion, but in the United States, they uh, they have a certain advantage over a lot of the other ethnicities, and that is they've got a very strong degree of racial awareness and racial consciousness, which they use. You know, I mean, just look at the way, I mean, in, in that video, you should have seen the way the two of them were discussing 
you know, the interests of their communities. It requires a tremendous degree of racial awareness and racial consciousness to be able to pursue those goals in the same way, with the same dedication, you know, that these people were doing, these people were going about. You know, there was no regard for the good of the whole or the good of the United States in general. All this fellow was concerned about, um, the Pakistani guy was concerned about, was getting aid to Pakistan. And of course, this is going to be at the expense of the U.S. taxpayer. Now, if he's an American citizen, it's the U.S. taxpayer that should be his priority, right? Not really the affairs of Pakistan. But that's not really the case here. So, like I said, it requires a great deal of racial consciousness to do this. And I think um, South Asians, especially Indians, and even the East Asians have that, which gives them that advantage. So, with this article on uh, national capitalism, uh, let's see. What are some more, uh, what are some fundamental policies of national capitalism uh, you say that uh, manufacturing, you say that resources need to be from domestic sources, there needs to be protectionism. Can you just go over a list of the fundamental policies that would be needed to have national capitalism? I think before we talked more about the culture, but what are actual like uh, public policies that would be necessary? I think, um, I think protectionism is important. Um, it, protectionism is very important. And uh, I think there should be some sort of regulation on outsourcing. Outsourcing is probably one of the worst things, one of the worst things that could have happened um, in the, to the U.S. In the 20, and even to North America in general in, uh, during the 20th century. Um, outsourcing is something that needs to be regulated. I mean, national... Um, with regards to protectionism, I know a lot of Western elites, neoliberals in particular, tend to hate and bash protectionism considerably. But protectionism has its advantages. You know, I mean, it's, it's, protectionism has served, um, has served India quite well. I mean, it's true that India's economy grew quite slowly um, from the 40s to the 80s. But they were able to build up their domestic industries. They were able to build, you know, they were able to create their own soft drinks industries and car industry, auto, you know, automotive industries, and so on. So protectionism is, of course, very important. And, of course, neoliberals hate it because it, you know, it bars them access to foreign markets. Outsourcing is another big deal. You know, um, outsourcing, of course, hurts the economy in many ways, many obvious ways. And another focus of national capitalism should be to bring back manufacturing. Manufacturing is very important because manufacturing, of course, accumulates capital in, you know, in a way that services cannot. Like I pointed out before, earlier in our conversation, you cannot really export a service. Well, you can export some services, of course. I mean, like, let's say, programming, computer software, and stuff like that. I mean, you can export some services, yes. But if you, if you, study, current, if you, if you study statistics currently, you know, it's, you know, the global economy, that is, in terms of international trade, is still dominated by the movement of goods, actual physical, tangible products, goods. So there should be an emphasis in bringing back manufacturing. Manufacturing is key because it creates, you know, it it creates, you know, it creates a certain skill set in the population. And of course, it also acts as a barrier against cultural Marxism as well. I pointed that out as well. That's also, that's also some somewhat of an added bonus, you know. Do you it, think uh, that banking sh banking should be a public utility? Um. I haven't really given banking too much thought, to be honest with you. I do know that our current banking system is somewhat broken, um, but whether this should be public, that's worth thinking about. I haven't really thought about banking a whole lot, no. I was focused more on uh, protectionism and manufacturing, mostly. But isn't, you know, uh, Donald Trump actually proposed uh, putting a tax on uh, outsourcing. Do you hear about that? That's not a bad idea. No, I was I wasn't aware of it, but I have but I was aware of I was aware of him trying to bring back manufacturing to the US. That's something I'd heard of. And taxing companies that outsource is actually a pretty good idea. And I think it's a very good idea in fact, because if you have a, if you have let's say you're a company that's in business, you're let's say you, you trade in say T shirts, for example, or any other item, right? Now, if you import some of these products from China or whatever, you're able, to, you're able to make more money than someone who's sourcing these products locally, obviously. And as you accumulate and as your profits 
and as your profits dwarf theirs, you know, you can then run them out of business. So this sort of thing works if everyone is into it, you know. So it's it's sort of like protectionism in some ways. You know, if but if you tax these companies, if you tax these companies that actually outsource or, you know, buy, you know, import products from abroad and they could very easily source them here locally, then you make their businesses somewhat uncompetitive as well. And that kind of levels the playing field, I think. So I think Trump has the right idea in some ways by, you know, taxing these companies that outsource. And I'd, so I'd go so far as to even taxing companies that try to import things from abroad, which is, of course, just protectionism, you know, increasing your duty, increasing import duties and such. So I think, uh, yeah, I think these things can, these things are viable. So this will force the economy to become somewhat more efficient, you know, manufacture what you need and then import only things that are not available to you locally. This is actually how India was able to weather the uh, the global recession of 2008 because much of what India manufactures and produces is consumed domestically. You know, there's China and some of these other countries, especially Singapore, you know, more export-dominated co- economies who are in trouble. But of course, um, that's, that's, that's another matter altogether. But I do think that, yes, you know, um, there should be a strong emphasis on um, preventing outsourcing. It's quite the bane of modern capitalism in my view. So uh, you have this article, Resisting Our Cultural Marxist Elites, A Few Strategies to Consider. And uh, first of all, right. I want to make make the point that I think the terminology uh, cultural Marxist elites could be – could kind of sound oxymoronic. Uh, I think Barry okay, Guy is actually – I think Barry Guy has made this point to sort of avoid using, like, the buzzword cultural Marxist because I think it's confusing to people. Because it's very different than economic Marxism. Uh, when people hear Marxism, they think about redistribution of wealth. So I, I agree with the points you make in this article, but I think the terminology cultural Marxism could be confusing to people. Do you agree with that point? I, I do think that it could be confusing. Yes, but. It's a term that so it's so that so accurately describes you know the modern left. Now I've I've heard various criticisms of the term cultural Marxism. Uh, first and foremost is that you know the Frankfurt School uh, intellectuals like Theodore Adorno and some of the others never really used that phrase themselves. They didn't. They just, they saw themselves as Marxists. And the idea here was that to them it was American culture, Western culture, traditional culture that's the greatest barrier you know that prevents you know, the rise of the, you know, revolution. And so the culture has to be taken down, torn down. And that's basically the base, then that's basically the premise of cultural Marxism right there. So now I understand they never use the phrase directly. And a lot of opponents, you know, a lot of, a lot of leftists have made this argument saying that, well, they never use this phrase. And so it's basically just this, you know, bogus boogeyman thing that alternative right-wingers use to create some sort of straw man but I don't necessarily agree with this, though. Just because the term was never used by Theodore Adorno does not necessarily mean the term lacks legitimacy. I mean, consider the fact that up until the second century AD, the term Christian was never really used. But did that, but did that mean that Christianity over the last two centuries did not exist? Well, of course it existed. But the term Christian itself came to be used much later on, you know, somewhere around the second century, probably after Tertullian or so. But... Um, that's 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 basically my take on it. I mean, I understand what what Barry guy is saying, but I don't necessarily agree. Though, I think it's a term that quite accurately describes what's become of the left identity politics, where you know you've got you know the bourgeoisie happen to be the white majority, and the new proletariat were basically these protected ethnic groups. So, it's it's the same idea of class struggle. It's just been reconfigured in some ways. And, uh, you know, sort of cast into a new mold here. I think what's confusing is that it's very different than economic Marxism. Not particularly, actually. If you think about it, it's it's really, it's the same idea. I mean, as I pointed out, you know, you just, you know, you, you're the bourgeoisie are basically just, you know, the white elites. Not just the white elites, actually, more like, you know, traditional Western culture. And, you know, you've got this traditional Western culture, which is seen as being inherently oppressive. And that was basically the idea behind um, Theodore Adorno's critical theory, you know. And um, so the idea that traditional Western culture is, in some ways, the tool of the bourgeoisie, and it oppresses various groups. 
And so, you know, these groups need to somehow, you know, the interests of these groups are quite separate from the interests of traditional Western culture, you know, the white majority and so on. So, you know, in some ways, of course, um, for the revolution to take place, you need, you need to tear down Western culture in the same way as in traditional economic Marxism. The only way the proletariat can win is if private property and wealth are abolished. So here in this case, it's traditional Western culture that's been marked for demolition. So if you, if you think about it, it's, it's not all that different. The focus, it's still, it's, it's still Marxism. It's just simply Marxism applied to culture. You know, in the same way as feminism is basically Marxism applied to gender. So it still is Marxism in my view. It shouldn't really confuse people, but I can see how it might confuse some. Yes, but I, I still think... Well, you're I still, talking about I still is, uh, the you're, you're talking about the oligarchy and uh, defunding the elites. So the points you make are to uh, boycott the media, to stay out of debt, and to boycott universities. As I pointed out a little earlier in our conversation, um, currently the system is such that it requires a certain degree of cooperation from us to thrive and sustain itself you know and uh, if we what we can do is we can choose not to cooperate not to participate and we can thereby encumber the system now we know that modern universities are the hotbeds of cultural marxism you know but by avoiding universities you know we can we can deprive our elites you know of uh, you know of this of this tool so i mean take a look at the economy and the economy also plays a role here i mean if you look at saskatchewan's economy here for example, there's a, it's not as it's not as services dominated as the economies of Ontario. For example, there still are there still is a very strong service sector here, no doubt. But there's also a lot of natural resources, a lot of manufacturing, and you know when you compare this to say Montreal or to Ontario, you know which are mostly services based, and you know that's one that's one of the reasons why there's somewhat of a there's there's not cultural Marxism has not reached the same level as it has in Ontario. You know, because if you have an economy that produces welders, plumbers, fabricators, and so on, it's going to produce necessarily produce fewer feminists and you know leftist majors and and so on. And it's true. I mean, in in my article, if you well, not this article, there's another article I I've written before this. If you had, I mean, where um, I went on, I logged on to the University of Saskatchewan's website, and I looked at their graduates, their numbers, and you know there was about 300 and something graduates that year in computer studies and only 19 in women's, in, you know, in women's, uh, women's studies. So it's, it's really quite interesting how the economy plays that role as well, but we can actually do this. We can, there are ways we can resist the system by simply not cooperating. There's no way we can actually go and restructure the system. That's not going to happen, but we can encumber the system. And that's the point I was trying to make. Turn off your TV, you know, don't go to movies. I mean, people, there's so many on the alternative, right? That complain about Hollywood degeneracy and, and all of that, but it's, there's a simple solution. Just don't go to the movies. Don't throw away your TV. You know. So there's 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 a lot of things that we can do to encumber the system. If we hit our elites where it hurts in the pocketbooks, then you know that'll 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 actually help in the long run. So uh, I think the key point to make is uh, I mentioned this earlier that. Uh, Important thing to focus on is is the oligarchy itself. A lot of this other stuff, like the the like the social justice warriors and a lot of the the culture is very important. But that's also the the root co where the real power structure is is the financial oligarchy. Oh, absolutely. There's absolutely no doubt there, though, because right now we still have this funny view that our elites represent our interests. But this is not really the case. I mean, I know there's some people that are somewhat cynical regarding corruption and nepotism, you know, amongst those in the upper echelons of society. And that's understandable. But no, but very few people actually understand or are aware of the fact that our elites are actually working or actually hostile, you know, to the interests of their nations. They're hostile to the interests of, you know, white people who are the majority here and in the founding stock of these nations. You know, they don't seem to understand that these elites, because it, when they look at these elites, they seem to think that, oh, well, you know, we're white and they're white. But they don't seem to understand that these elites are actually host, they're actually hostile to the interests of the white majority. They're working against them, actively working against them in ways that non-Western elites do not. I mean, non-Western elites might be corrupt, but they still do look out for their people to some degree, with the exception of India, of course. But um, even in the Middle East, for example, I mean, if you look at, 
if you look at some of these, if, I mean, we were talking about their their social welfare programs that are, that are you know targeted directly to uh, their own citizens who are like 20% of the population. So they're a privileged minority. You were making the point that in the United Arab Emirates, what they do is they they actually will cut off benefits to political dissidents. But for the most part, who are the political dissidents? Are they people who want to make the country more Islamic, or are they mostly people who want more freedom? Well, the, the United Arab Emirates and you know Qatar, Dubai, Qatar, and Kuwait, and with the exception of Saudi Arabia, some of these countries have a somewhat love-hate relationship with the Wahhabis. You know, on one hand, you know, the inter- on one hand, most most Emiratis actually subscribe to a Wahhabi interpretation of Islam, but on the other hand, they don't want Wahhabis to come to power because a lot of their economy still depends on foreign investment, tourism, and all that, right? So they've got a somewhat of a love-hate relationship with Wahhabis. Secretly, they do, they do, you know, they do agree with them. They do actually share certain, they do share certain elements of their worldview. I mean, they do have certain elements of their worldview in common, but they also want, kind of want to keep them at arm's length. But on the other hand, you also have other dissidents that are, you know, somewhat against the authoritarian nature of the United Arab Emirates. You know, they want the system to be more transparent. They're not actually calling for um, dismantling the monarchy, but what they are really calling for, at least from what I've learned while I was living there, is that they're actually calling for greater transparency. Where's the money coming from? Where's the money going? You know, the, the, the system should be somewhat more democratic. You know, we're not trying to replace Sheikh Mohammed and his family. We're not trying to replace the Khalifas. But what we're trying to do here, at least from their point of view, is make the system more transparent, you know, so that Emiratis can, you know, participate within, you know, and within certain, you know, within certain policies that determine their own interests. But as far as the elites themselves are concerned, to go back to a previous point, yes, they actually do look out for their people. You know, you have these generous uh, welfare programs and such, but there's this confusion relationship almost, if I can even use the term, with regards to the Middle East, where if the elites are benevolent, then they expect complete obedience from, you know, the subjects that they're, they're ruling. And if there are any dissidents, it's seen as a somewhat of a, seen as a breach of social contract. The elites are obviously being generous, so why are you complaining? You know, why are you rebelling? What's your problem? That's their attitude. At least that's the impression I get. So, in Dubai, that seems to be really largely the case. You know, we're being benevolent to you, and you should reciprocate with obedience. But there really, but there genuinely is a certain degree of concern that the elites have for their people. And there's, a, I mean, Dubai's welfare program is just ridiculous. You know, I mean, in just how, I mean, in just how generous it is. It's too generous, in fact, of course. I mean, it's, it's created a culture where people have become too lazy to work, especially Emiratis. But that's about to change, and it has been changing over the last five or six years because the, the global recession kind of left Dubai broke. So there's really not a whole lot of money to give out now in these in these uh, socialist programs. So people are forced to work, and there's some interesting changes going on in the Middle East at this point. So uh, we are out of time. I would like to thank uh, Dota for being on the show. Uh, check out his website, uh, Occident Invicta. Thanks very much for having me, Robert. Appreciate it. Thanks again. Uh, That's all we have for today's show, so take care, and we'll be back with you next time.